Howdy folks and welcome to Board Game Breakfast episode 5 recorded December 16th, 2013. We're halfway through the last month of the year. Lots of exciting things. First of all, we'd like to say a big happy birthday to Mark Andre in Montreal. Happy birthday to you. We also like to uh, thank all those of you who are watching and uh, we do listen to the comments and stuff. We're always trying to make this show better, always looking for ways. And one of the ways we make the show better is coming up soon in January where we'll have a Kickstarter where you can support the Dice Tower. You can also support Dice Tower now by going over to our website. We have promos for Mage Wars and Robinson Crusoe and custom dice like we have back here. But enough of that. that you're not here for that. You're here to hear about board gaming news, so let's jump right into it. news first let's talk about dice tower convention dice tower cubed the third one coming up this july over the july 4th period of time and you're welcome to come you can sign up at dicetowercon.com don't don't uh, delay we already have 100 folks who've signed up and the last two years it has sold out both times a great time five days of gaming and many of folks from the dice tower will be there it's gonna be super fun so you can find out more about that again at dicetowercon.com in the uh, board gaming news, there's not much because that's just what happens usually in December. Fifth Street Games says that um, probably in January we'll see Baldrick's Tomb. This was a successful Kickstarter, I think, in March of this year. It's supposed to be a short, quick and dirty dungeon crawl with really light, humorous artwork, family game, 30 minutes. Stronghold, we found out that they have a third Space Cadet game on the way. This one, though, is not from the Engelstein family. Rather, it's from Don Raspler and Al Rose. This is a game about basically getting out of the spaceship and going out and fighting aliens, and that's pretty much all I know. But the first two Space Cadet games were good, so this sounds fun. And the Dow Barcelona Award was given to Erwin Glonegger. Now, if you don't know who Erwin is, the, that's to be forgiven because I did not either. And I went and looked this up because he got a Lifetime Board Game Achievement Award. And he was born in 1925 when he went through World War II, but got involved in gaming. And he's responsible for bringing many games to the market. Not necessarily the designer, but kind of a facilitator. Memory, a game many people know of. The first Spiel des Jahres winners, Hare and Tortoise. And he was one of the first people to realize the internet was internationalization of the board gaming market and so helped bring board games and helped Ravensburger, got Ravensburger to produce uh, jigsaw puzzles and, and other things and so he's done many things kind of behind the scenes and so it's good to see him get upcoming games that are coming out this week available at coolstuffinc.com now again this may or may not happen because of distribution problems and who knows weather etc but this is what you should see coming out this week rampage the game that uh, i've reviewed it and dan king has reviewed it smashing monsters super fun canalis the fourth game of the uh templar series or the tempest series i'm sorry from aeg and you'll see my review of that coming out this week freedom a great cooperative game um, about freeing the slaves. Great history in there. Just reviewed that last week. Suburbia Incorporated, the wonderful expansion for Suburbia. Uh, Chupacabra survived the night. If you remember, this was the first game that Steve Jackson picked up when they basically offered to buy games outright from small companies. And War Machine High Command, Big Guns. This is their, I think, the first expansion, small expansion for the popular game War Machine High Command deck building game. Quelf of Cool Katoo Trees. Let's play Quelf of Cool Katoo Trees. The Sprickish Prash. The Sprickish Prash. Let's play The Sprickish Prash. that came out last week we have the my little pony ccg hit with not just a splash but a storm uh keep your kids away from it collectible card game you'll spend lots of money amerigo from eagle games along with dark darker darkest and templar another game you'll see a review from me this week uh from fantasy flight the expansion for netrunner mala tempura and the star wars balance of the force which has you know your typical stuff on the cover but mara jade hooray uh baba yaga the second game in the kid game series from yellow 
Uh, what the food? And then the Nations. Nations made a really big splash at SNN at Board Game Geek Con. Uh, I, the Civilization kind of game, it's long. I haven't had a chance to play this one, but looks like it could be pretty good. And then Battle Lore 2, a very fantastic looking game. Just opened my copy this week. Wow, the miniatures are fantastic. So that's out from Fantasy Flight. All right, let's see how smart you are. Since the second installment of The Hobbit is now in theaters and The Hobbit is currently all the rage again, what do you know about The Hobbit theme as it relates to our hobby? Question 1. How many standalone Hobbit themed games exist as listed on Board Game Geek? And this doesn't include re-themed games, games that never came to fruition, or expansions to other games. A. 5 to 10 B. 10 to 15 C. 15 to 20 or D, 20 to 25? And the correct answer is C, 15 to 20. The total is really about 18, give or take one or two. This Hobbit license has surprisingly extended to many publishers. Question two. Out of these 18 games, how many were released in the last two years in anticipation with the Peter Jackson movie release? A, 11. B13, C16, or D8? Well, our answer is A11. But sadly enough, with this great theme, none of these games yet have a geek rating higher than 6. Next, we move to the higher end of our Hobbit themed games. Games designed by our favorite designers, Reiner Knizia, Martin Wallace, and Eric M. Lang. For question three, we're going to match each Hobbit themed game on the left with the correct designer on the right. And the correct answers are The Hobbit Journey to the Lonely Mountain, designed by Eric M. Lang, The Hobbit, designed by Reiner Knizia, and The Hobbit Card Game, designed by Martin Wallace. If the Lord of the Rings trilogy is any indication about how many Hobbit-themed games we can expect, then we should be seeing about 15 more in the next two years. Well, I wouldn't have got many of those, but I have to say that the, the Hobbit Desolation of Smaug is awesome! But anyhow, new segment here. The uh, One Hit Wonders, and this is a segment that was inspired by a geek list that someone did at Board Game Geek, where they looked at games that I had in my top 100 list for just one year. It was on the list, and then it was off the list. And so, in this segment, I'm going to talk about those games, revisit them, and maybe talk about kind of like a revisiting my opinion, and why my opinion maybe isn't as high as it was before. But, in this very first segment, I want to talk about the whole thing. First of all, I have a hard time explaining this to people, but 100 games for me is a small subsection of the games that I've actually played. i played somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 games. That is a lot of games that I've played. And let's just go with the low number, the 3,000. If I have 100 games that are my favorites out of 3,000, that's one game out of every 30 makes it in. And that's a very, you know, it's 3%. And as, you know, with 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, as time goes by, that percentage is going to get smaller and smaller. So it's not just good games that have been knocked out of the top 100, but it's great games that have been knocked out of the top 100. And so when someone comes to me and goes, you said you really like this game. You said you love this game and it wasn't in your top 100. There are lots of games that I cannot limit myself to just 100 that I like. In my collection as is, I have th about 300 games in my collection. And so I have more than just my top 100 in my gaming collection. Then there's also just the fact that sometimes games fall out of my top 100 because I don't play them as much or over time I've kind of got my, they were really, really fun, but as time has gone by I found other games that, that replace them. That's a big thing that happens. A game is replaced by another game. Or a game is sitting in 110, 120, or I've just simply played better games. But you're probably more interested in the specifics of what, you know, about each game. So tune in next week and weeks in the future and you'll see this uh, segment pop up from time to time where I'll take one of these games and explain just why I don't like it quite as much as I did at one point in time. All right, let's go to Scott. Hi there everyone, this is 
Scott Nicholson, and welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower, where we take a quick look at an aspect of games in higher education. And this week, I'm going to talk about a concept that I have grabbed onto and used for my work called transformative games. Now, uh, Jesse Shell actually talked about the, the transformational power of games, and this idea of games can be something that change people. And what happens if you use games to help change people? And, and you can do that for good, or you can do that for not so good. I mean, you see a lot of studies out there about are games violent? Do games create violent tendencies? So games actually have the power to change you. And that's the focus of my research, is I try to understand how do you create games that change people? I do this through a couple things. I'm looking at the concept of gamification, which I'll talk about in another episode. And I'm also looking at the concept of making self-contained games. But the idea is this is an umbrella term. And you might have heard some of these other terms like educational games or games for change or serious games. Serious games, you know, as a term, it tends to mean the same kind of thing. Games used for a serious purpose as compared for a recreational purpose. But that doesn't sound very fun. Um, as educational games... Well, we've got a, a history of very bad educational game design. It's getting better. Uh, but really, in the past, we had this model of creating games for learning that would be either a quiz and you get a dancing monster on the screen or you get a dancing monster on the screen and then you get a quiz. And uh, this idea of, of asking people questions uh, on a topic is a very superficial way to educate folks. Uh, and and there's, there are better ways to actually get in deep and look at that stuff. But you've got games for change as well. Games for change uh, tend to be games made for societal change. Uh, World Without Oil uh, was an example of this, where the idea was to help people understand what would go on in a global oil crisis. Um, Super Better is actually a gamification structure to help you change your own life, to help you make differences in your own life. But this whole category is, is trans, uh, transformative games, the idea of someone goes through a process, and it can be adults or kids. They're not just looking at this being stuff for kids, but adult learning happens as well, um, and they're changed. Corporations use a lot of these in training their employees, in doing HR training. There's a heavy uh, emphasis on, on transformative uh, processes in corporations, and a key part of adult learning and transformation is this idea of reflection. The idea that you do something, and you reflect upon it, and that's what, where learning happens. That's actually something that Dewey talked about, who's a learning theorist. And he said, if you do stuff, but you don't reflect upon it, then you don't learn anything. So what I'd like you to do now is think about the last game you played and reflect upon how it changed your life. Hmm. Hmm? Hmm. There, you've just learned something. Hooray! <laughs> anyway. I will talk to you all later with another aspect of games in higher education. Goodbye. So what's coming out from the Dice Tower this week? Well, lots of reviews. Dan has done a pile. You'll see some reviews. You'll see a preview from me this week. But of the different games I have here, you should see several of these coming out. I'm definitely going to be taking a look at The Hobbit Desolation of Smog, which is the second part to the unexpected journey here. We'll be taking a look at Expedition, probably, Hegemonic Speculation and Templar, Kaboom, Serpent Stones, the expansion for Smash Up, and uh, Canalis, as I said earlier, and hopefully the Thunderstone Numenera. So that's some of the stuff I'm hoping to get out. I might get a few more of these reviewed. And of course, all the games from here down are games that I need to play and review, or at least play some more and review them. So there's quite a bit that, that has to get done at this point in time. Also this week, you um, don't forget to go to DicetowerNetwork.com and listen to all the different podcasts in the Dice Tower Network. And we will be, you know, there's other things coming up. We'll be recording our top 10 of 2013. That's not coming out this week, but next week for Christmas, for your sake. And there's other cool things that are on the horizon, so keep an eye out for those, including a live 24-hour Watch us play here at the Dice Tower, which seems really boring to me, but a lot of people have asked for it. All right, back to the show to Dan. Hey folks, I'm not Tom Vassell. I don't talk like him. I don't act like him. I don't dislike the Mr. Jack series like him. And I definitely don't look like him. Although you might be confused because I am wearing a silly hat and an ugly tie. Well, let's fix that. Ah, much better. I feel much better. So, why am I not Tom Vassell? Why am I saying this? Well, I've been getting a, uh, a decent enough people asking me this question that I feel like it needs to be addressed, which is, 
hey, I've never seen you totally destroy a game. I've never seen you strongly dislike a game. I've never seen you throw a game off a roof. Uh, your reviews tend to be pretty positive. Do you dislike any games? Uh, and it's a good question. And I could say, well, I'm not Tom Vassell, meaning uh, I don't get unsolicited review copies up to the gills, thousands of them sent to my house every year. In fact, I don't get unsolicited review copies. I'm kind of glad because I don't envy Tom in this fact because uh, he plays everything under the sun, which is cool. I, I definitely don't want to do that, but I thank him for doing it because he can find diamonds in the rough that I don't have time to find. And I, I can let him do all the hard work for me and then just play him and have fun. Uh, <laughs> but I don't get all those unsolicited. The review copies that I get, I am specifically interested in. I am going out of my way to ask publishers for specific review copies of games that I know that are a genre or a theme or a collaboration of both that I will most likely already like because I know what I like. So knowing that, when I get review copies in, I already know pretty much, unless something's really different than I expected, I really research the games before I ask for them. Uh, and there's, it's a very good chance that I'm going to love the game, or at least like it, or at least think it's okay. Very rarely uh, am I so wrong in knowing what I like that when I get something, I'm going to destroy it. Uh, if I do get something that, I, that I'm pretty sure I'm going to like, but it's just not as good, or I don't like it, I'm usually pretty good about pointing out if I don't like it, who would like this? Because who am I? I'm just a guy in a room with some games on my shelf. Uh, and I don't want to tell you what to think. I want to tell you uh, my, my sort of way of doing this is to use the top end equipment, give you high quality, high energy reviews, and to give you a detailed overview, probably more detailed than most, which is why my reviews are a little bit longer than, than some, uh, but my engineering background is detail oriented, so I give you enough details to let you decide what you think after you've watched me show you how to play the game. Uh, I also <clears throat> do dislike games. Uh, some that you guys would kill me for disliking. Dominion? I don't like it. I don't really like deck builders in a hole. I know, you want to shoot me. Seven Wonders? Hated it. Kill me now. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's another? Uh, seasons? Hated it. Kill me now. Okay, so now everybody is going to shut the TV off and hate them. If I'd got every game under the sun like Tom and I just have to play everything, sure, I'd be, I'd be negatively talking about a lot of these games. But just so you know, that's why I am uh, who I am and why my reviews are the way they are. And I hope this gives you some more insight as to me as a reviewer and a person. Now, first of all, Dan, I would like to point out that I don't think anyone's going to kill you over your opinions of Dominion, etc. But I do have to say, for someone who is so nice about games, you're kind of harsh and you're critiquing of ties, ugly ties, harumph. All right, well, anyway, it's always good to know how to do things. We always, our show is called the Dice Tower, but there's something quite almost as useful as a dice tower, and that's a dice tray. Let's find out how to build one. Hi, my name is Damien, and this is my garage, and today we're going to talk about gifts for gamers. I was listening to Blue Peg, Pink Peg the other day, and they were looking for ideas. So here's some ideas real quickly. Got some meeples, which these are D&D &D meeples uh, for Lords of Waterdeep. And you can go to a place like Meeple Source to get stuff like that also. Great idea. Um, we've got storage containers. You can see these are Plano boxes. I picked these up at uh, Lowe's. Again, they're very inexpensive. And they do a great job. They come in various sizes. They do a great job of holding uh, your, your components together. Another idea. This is from Hobby Lobby. This is a big thing. Uh, this can hold stuff like Dominion cards. Uh, I'm going to use mine for Sentinels of the Multiverse. Uh, some other great ideas uh, for storage, Just these are called really useful boxes. I got these up from uh, Staples or uh, pretty much any home improvement store or uh, office supply store hold them. These hold the cards for the print and play game of Mary and Mr. Darcy right now. Uh, another idea would be anything that's expansions, obviously, for a game that maybe your gamer likes. There's Power Grid. Uh, this is a Tom Basil approved expansion. This is Ticket to Ride India with Switzerland. It's great for two to three players. Uh, you can look at expansions, of course, for Guild Hall. You name it, there's expansions for it, including uh, maybe get some extra dice if they have a game like Formula D. Of course, dice is a great gift for any gamer, especially RPG players. Uh, and again, some other ideas include maybe an expansion for X-Wing, because you know you can never have enough Millennium Falcons. Uh, another idea would be maybe to get a gift. Uh, and this is a little box I picked up from Michaels, from Michaels for about $1.99. And inside, and if you get this to a girl, ladies, you better have some jewelry in it. Right now, it just has a love letter. Now, what I've also done is instead of the cubes in here, I went to Michael's and picked up some little hearts. 
and makes a nice little addition to the game, makes it a little bit more thematic. And then, in addition, another idea you might want to do is I took all the verbiage from Love Letter, Love Letter and applied it to uh, Game of Thrones theme. So I went on the internet and I printed up uh, the images I downloaded for uh, Game of Thrones, and then I used the same verbiage. Uh, that go with the love letter. And instead of using hearts, I have little skulls. So I don't know if you can see those real well, but long story short is, these are just some quick ideas that you can use to get your gamer for Christmas. And hope, hope you have a good time playing the games. Have fun and thanks for watching. Hey guys. More specifically, let me say, hey geeks. Because you know what? There's a lot of geeks these days. In fact, sometimes I wonder if there might be more geeks than there is non-geeks. The fascination with superhero movies and Hobbit movies and all sorts of nerdy things in gaming, etc. Everybody plays computer games these days under the age of 30. It's, this is not a, a minor thing. And so there's a lot of geeks out there. Now, if you're a geek who is my age, in the 30s, I'm 37, but if you're a geek my age, you certainly will remember in school that we were made fun of and people mocked us because we weren't good at sports and we weren't good at other things. So I have to caution you, geeks, that now that we have the majority, that we don't consistently do the same thing to other people. You know, when I would play someone as a kid in sports and they would dominate over me, that wouldn't be very fun, especially if they would rub it in my face. The same thing happens in, in, in computer games. I remember the very first time that I played Street Fighter against somebody, and they said, here, let me show you how to play, and they came and beat me up, and they did a million things. And I said, you know, how am I supposed to fight back? Like, Don't worry, you'll get it. Or we would play Super Mario, I remember the first time, and I'd play Luigi, and I'd play Mario, and they would go through eight levels, then I would run up and die, then it would be their turn. And that wasn't any fun for me, especially as they would mock me for doing so. And that's where I want to talk a little bit about today is that we have to be very cautious to mo not mock those people. Like the rolling of your eyes when somebody says, yeah, there was those 12 dwarves, that bomber guy. And you're like, <clears throat> that's not how you pronounce his name. And that wasn't the right dwarf. And we looked down their nose at them. We looked down our nose at other geeks. You know, just this past week, I talked about a game called It's Alive in one of my reviews. And I said that there was a Frankenstein-like monsters in the game. And someone had to email me and say, now, it's not Frankenstein. Frankenstein's not the name of the monster. Frankenstein's the name of the scientist. The monster is just the monster. And Frankenstein is the doctor. So they wanted me to say Frankenstein's monsters like monsters. But the fact is, is that when I say Frankenstein, every person in the world knew what I was talking about. And yet a geek had to come in and make themselves look superior. And a geek has to come in and make themselves look superior when people pronounce things wrong. Now, I'm a horrible pronunciator. I am. And I even make fun of myself on the show about that, especially when it comes to names I was never taught in school and don't go out of my way to figure out how to pronounce them. Like our good friend Drizzt, whose name I almost always mispronounce on purpose these days, and every time I do I get emails from people. I remember the, I was talking about the people from Heroescape, and people emailed me and said, you're pronouncing them wrong. Was I supposed to read a Heroescape pronunciation guide somewhere? When I don't know how to pronounce the names of all the different people in Lord of the Rings and Hobbit and Harry Potter, etc., or know how they're all interrelated, or know that Final Fantasy VI is actually not six, but it's, not, I mean, it's Final Fantasy III was not actually three, but it was number six, and seven came after that, and the reason that Square left Nintendo and blah, 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 blah. I don't mind learning those things. I'm just cautioning people against beating others over the head about those and looking down their noses and going, because come on, the stuff we do as geeks is fun. You gotta admit the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit movies are some of the greatest movies ever made and they're geeky movies. Avengers is geeky and we want people to come and say, this is fun, these board games, these things are so awesome and terrific and wonderful. So why would we chase people away? Why would we make other people look down on it. You say, Vassal, this sounds like a roundabout way for you getting out of knowing how to pronounce things. Well, maybe. And I, you know, I, I like to consider myself a geek, but I've met in every subject that I've ever been a geek in, I've known someone who knows more than me. Well, maybe not board games. <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, I've always met someone who's like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. 
Oh, okay. But we mustn't put people down. So when I meet somebody and I say, hey, I want to tell you about board games, and they say, like Monopoly, I say, yes. I don't say, Monopoly? Well, that's all I'm trying to say, folks. Let's be friendly. I like everyone in the world to be a geek, but if they don't want to be, that's okay. Last week, we talked about games that save you money. But any gamer knows that money is not the only resource. So this week, we're going to talk about games that save you the most important resource of all, and that's time. Let's face it, none of us is getting any younger. And unless you're a teenager with no sense of your own mortality, sitting down to an eight-hour game of, well, anything, doesn't really pack a lot of appeal. We're busy people. We've got jobs to do, spouses to appease, bills to pay. When we scrape together enough time to play a game, odds are we're not looking for a quick round of Advanced Squad Leader. So, what games don't take forever to set up and play? Coup. Coup is the sequel to Resistance, and it plays in about five to ten minutes. Trust me, with this secret identity and bluffing game, that's five to ten minutes well spent. Or how about Marrakesh? This tantalizingly tactical, tactile textile game is about carpet merchants in Morocco, and it plays in about 15 to 20 minutes. With a name like 8-Minute Empire, you know it's going to be fast. Now, 8 minutes is a bit of an exaggeration, but 12 and a half to 15 minute empire just kind of lacks the poetry. The grand champion of all fast games? Gotta be Win Lose Banana! This three player guessing game takes less than a minute to play. That's faster than anything else on Earth. I mean, you can't even make minute rice in a minute. Alright, don't conceal the banana. Strangest acting note I've ever had. Don't conceal the banana. Alrighty. David's Board Shorts presents David's Gaming Glossary. Let's learn together. Today's word is print and play. Print and play games are games you make yourself. Some games are print and play only, but you can make your own homemade versions of other games that are either too rare or expensive. These you can bling out in any way you want. Huh. First prize in a beauty contest. for this time all right 10 days till christmas life is very exciting we will see you guys all throughout this week with videos and all sorts of things as i said go to dicetowernetwork.com or dicetower.com until next time i'm tom Basil, and you've been watching board game breakfast to find out more about all of our podcasts check out dicetowernetwork.com to see a listing of our videos head to dicetower.com We'd like to thank our sponsor, Cool Stuff Incorporated, where you can buy games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock.